Hi, my name is Carol Shields. I'm here at the Wills Eye Hospital Alumni Society newsroom in Philadelphia. I'm sitting here with my colleagues, Dr. Jerry Shields and Dr. Sarah Lally from the Ocular Oncology Service at Wills Eye Hospital. We thought it would be a good idea today to talk to you about the topic of pigmented conjunctival tumors. What should I do? And I thought it might be nice to maybe start with a little discussion on conjunctival nevus. Maybe I'll ask Jerry Shields. Um, how common is conjunctival nevus? Is it pigmented or non-pigmented? Give us a little background here. Well, it's very common in our practice, and actually it is in the real world as well, but many of them are filtered into us because of our specific interest in them. They are generally uh, pigmented, but on some occasions they can be without pigment and be an entirely amelanotic. And in those cases, it can be recognized by looking for small cysts which in the lesion, which is highly suggestive of the diagnosis of the choroidal, of the conjunctival nevus. Good, thank you. Um, what is the, Dr. Lally, the average age that you might see conjunctival nevus? And when do you really believe these appear on the surface of the eye? So you're not born with freckles or moles, but at some point in time, they do develop. Usually the average child who comes into our room is, or into our office is usually around uh, five or six years old um, and they can continue to develop and especially during the preteen years with hormonal changes they start to get noticed a little bit more. Yeah you know even when they come in at age five or six in my mind I, I think this has probably been there all along and it's just become a little more pigmented in the preteen years. So let me just pose a question for you. What would you do if a new one was detected in a 40-year-old patient. Does that worry you? So it is a little more unusual that it wasn't there prior to age 40, although definitely over time, like I said, with hormonal changes, um, it can get more pigmented, so it gets noticed more. So the question kind of becomes, was it just not noticed um, and has been there the whole time, which more than likely it has been. But in someone who is 40, where there's a new onset of pigmentation, um, that does make me a little more concerned and a little more warranted for having uh, a procedure to remove it. Yeah, do you agree with that, Jerry? Uh, older patient with a new onset pigmented lesion? Yes, we generally become suspicious that it could be a melanoma and we lean toward excising them by special techniques that we employ. Okay. How about if the pigmentation's in the plica or in the caruncle region, does that worry you in a younger patient? It worries us a little more because that's nasally where you don't have such distinct margins. And in the caruncle in particular, they can grow deeper without a visible margin. So in these cases, if you do not remove them completely, they run the risk of invasion deeper into the caruncle and into the orbit. So in those cases, we take it a little more seriously and try to do a wider excision and sometimes even take a frozen section at the right. bottom of the lesion that's been removed looking for t further tumor. Yeah. So your comments about the wider resection, that's in regard to an older patient with a pigmented lesion in that region? Yes. Yeah, okay. Because I know young kids can have conjunctival nevi on the limbus, in the plica, in the caruncle. It's pretty rare though to see it uh, on the tarsal conjunctiva. We, I mean, occasionally we'll see it there, but that's pretty very, rare. Yeah, that is very Makes you think of see. other things. So, Sarah, I mean, Conj nevus transformation into melanoma, one in every 100 or 200? I'd say there's about a 1% chance that they can transform into yeah. melanoma, especially as they get into the later uh, uh, years. Um, you know, usually we like to have them removed because we will see patients that are in their 40s um, that have had a pigmented lesion there their whole life and it is a melanoma, and at pathology, it does um, show that the base is nevoid component. Yeah, so it was probably mm -hmm. a nevus sitting there for a long, a long time. time. Well, let's move on from conjunctival nevus to conjunctival melanosis. You know, there's two types of, there's really three types of melanosis. There's complexion-related melanosis that we see in patients of dark skin complexion, and then we have secondary melanosis that comes when you have exposure of the conjunctiva, it sometimes will become secondarily pigmented. 
And then we have primary acquired melanosis. That's the one that worries me the most. Um, Dr. Jerry, I mean, how does primary acquired melanosis appear? What should the ophthalmologist look for? The ophthalmologist should look for a pigmented lesion on the conjunctiva without cysts yeah. and consider the diagnosis of PAM. It uh, differs from racial melanosis or complexion-related melanosis by the fact that it uh, is found usually in distinct areas and does not extend deeper into the um, tissues. Right. Right. So, I mean, also racial melanosis tends to be fairly symmetric, bilateral, whereas primary acquired melanosis is usually pretty much unilateral. Um, Dr. Sarah, you know, so a patient comes in, they have like one or two clock hours of primary acquired melanosis at the limbus. What are you going to tell them? So basically, I look to see if I can find pigment anywhere else on the surface of the eye. I look for any component onto the cornea um, because that does make me a little more concerned um, mm -hmm. because naturally pigment should stop uh, and not grow onto the cornea. Um, mm -hmm. And if it's one or two uh, clock hours, it depends if it's been there their whole life or if this is something new. Um, lots of times when it's about at one clock hour, I'll prefer to observe mm -hmm. um, unless there's a corneal uh, component. Mm -hmm. um, and then once it gets larger uh, than one clock hour, I start discussing, you know, that this pigment shouldn't be there and that maybe um, something should be done. Right, okay. Another important point is the uh, thickness. Yeah. PAM and racial melanosis are generally uh, flat if they're benign, but PAM, if it gets thicker, then you begin to be more concerned that it's evolving into melanoma. That's exactly right. You know, we like to look at PAM under the microscope because you can tell if it's low risk or high risk for transformation into melanoma. Can you tell us a little bit about that? The histopathology yes. of PAM. Yes, PAM is usually within the surface epithelium. It's flat and the cells have more benign and less aggressive features. And if you see PAM that is thicker or more bothersome like that, then you're dealing more likely with a melanoma rather yeah. than PAM. Er, even early melanoma. I know the dermatologist, dermatopathologist, like to call primary acquired melanosis melanoma in situ because they really feel the high risk PAM that has atypia, atypical cells is really melanoma. It just hasn't broken deep through the basement membrane to become melanoma yet. Um, so back to Dr. Sarah Lally. Let's say you have a patient who comes in and they have PAM everywhere on all 12 clock hours of the conjunctiva. Uh, what are your options for these patients? So there's a few different options. Uh, one of them would be topical uh, medicines like mitomycin, interferon, 5-FU. Do you really believe interferon works? Um, I have not been impressed by interferon at all. Yeah, I think it's mostly mitomycin, 5-FU. Correct. Yeah. yeah, so mitomycin, although you have more problems with stem cell deficiency and scarring after using it. Um, the other option is uh, surgery um, to remove, although if it's so extensive you can't remove all of the pigment. Um, but the number one choice that I like to go to for pigmentation is cryotherapy. Yeah, me too. I like cryotherapy because it's you, the doctor, doing it, so you know exactly where you treated the PAM, and you don't have to rely on a patient putting in an eye drop that can burn and cause them to not even want to use the drop. So I, I agree with you. I like cryotherapy for really extensive primary acquired melanosis. So bottom line, you know, we talked about the risks of nevus evolution into melanoma, very low. Risks of PAM evolution into melanoma. While well, quoted figures range anywhere from 9% to 30%, depending upon the amount of atypia. So, you know, I think we should take PAM pretty seriously. Again, to summarize, small degrees of PAM we might watch if it's one or two clock hours. But when it's more than two clock hours, I think we, all of three of us, tend to want to intervene. 
You agree, agree. with that? I agree. There's been some controversy among dermatopathologists and ophthalmic pathologists with regard to the terminology. The word melanoma tends to scare patients. And when you have a small patch of PAM that's been removed and it looks quite benign uh, without much atypia, still many dermatopathologists will call this melanoma in situ, which scares patients to hear the word melanoma for some of these lesions that we as ophthalmologists know are not that aggressive and therefore we choose to avoid the term melanoma and call it primary acquired melanosis with or without atypia. Yeah, that's a good point. So let's move on to our last topic and our last topic is conjunctival melanoma. Um, you know, there were two studies that recently showed that the incidence of conjunctival melanoma is on the rise, just like skin melanoma is on the rise. Um, and it's believed that, you know, sun exposure, re changes in atmosphere um, has allowed for greater incidence of conjunctival melanoma, most of which arises from primary acquired melanosis. So, I mean, how often do uh, you see conjunctival melanoma in your practice? So I'd say refer to us every week. Um, it is on the um, common side, but not very common side, I would say. Yeah. And so you, you see patients every week with nevus, PAM, and melanoma. Just in a nutshell, uh, tell me how you differentiate these three very different pigmented conditions. So to start with the nevus, um, when you look at the patient, um, usually that stops at the limbus, it doesn't grow into the cornea, and lots of times they'll have cyst in it. And that's kind of the real um, distinguishing feature of the nevus is stopping at the limbus and the intrinsic cyst. Um, it can have feeder vessels just like other um, cancers which always make people concerned, um, but that is normal. And then when you look at um, PAM, the primary acquired melanosis, the pigmentation is usually flat, kind of a granular appearance. A little bit different with the racial melanosis where you can see it at the uh, limbus, however, it's more a cobblestone appearance. Yeah. Whereas the primary acquired melanosis kind of just is a flat pigment that's there. Yeah, it almost looks like, you know, the surface of the conj is peppered. Peppered, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And then melanoma has a more um, nodule appearance to it. There will be feeder vessels that go into it. Mm -hmm. And you can have it in combination with both nevi and um, primary acquired yeah. melanosis. Yeah. So lots of times they'll have a melanoma and then there'll be scattered pigment along the surface of the eye also. Right. So um, just want to get an idea of what you both feel about incisional biopsy to confirm melanoma. Is it a good idea or a bad idea? Jerry? Each patient has to be individualized because you have to know uh, whether or not to do a partial biopsy or remove the whole lesion. And that will depend on the clinical findings. It's very common in our practice to see someone who sees a pigmented lesion in an office elsewhere and they do a, quote, biopsy to find out if it's melanoma and then refer it into our service. We do not believe that is the way they should be done. An excisional biopsy in these cases is much more appropriate if the tumor is not too large. And if we can remove the whole tumor, it's better. We've seen cases of some melanomas that are totally amelanotic mm -hmm. in the conjunctiva without cysts. And in those cases, people have not suspected melanoma but still done a small biopsy and then referred them in for management. They should, when possible, get a complete excisional biopsy rather than just an incisional biopsy yeah. when possible. I think my best advice is if you see something that looks like a melanoma and you're worried about a melanoma, send it to a specialist, send it to an ocular oncologist because they have the know-how, the technique, and the assistance to completely remove the tumor without making an incision into it. Because once you cut into a melanoma, then the cat could be out of the bag. You might be seeding the tumor elsewhere. Which brings me to my next point. Um, do you think, Dr. Lally, that mitomycin C works for melanoma or interferon works for melanoma? What works for melanoma? So excision works for melanoma. That's about it. Do you know? Mm -hmm. You have to cut out melanomas. 
you can freeze primary acquired melanosis, but melanoma definitely needs to be excised. Yeah, I agree. I think it, this is a surgical t tumor. Uh, you're not going to get by by putting the patient on topical medications. It won't go deep enough to kill the cancer completely. Even oh. those that uh, are operated on, though, sometimes uh, cryotherapy is still helpful to use after we remove the tumor in the same operation to be sure that the cryo will eliminate or kill any cells near the margin that might not be seen that well clinically. Yeah. Um, about 15% of patients who have conjunctival melanoma wind up with exoneration. Um, Dr. Sarah, your, your indications for exoneration? So I think basically it kind of goes back to that first treatment, making sure that uh, tumor is not sh shed at the time of the initial uh, surgery. Um, but some patients, when the tumor does get shed and it gets shed into the orbit, those are the times when you're starting to talk about orbital exoneration. Um, so orbital involvement is definitely a reason for exoneration. Yeah. It's a, it's a shame to exonerate because the eye is generally in pretty good shape, but you have to take out all the orbital tissue to prevent metastatic disease. I think there's been a bit of a misconception among some physicians who don't see this that often that you must rush to exoneration if you see anything in the fornix or deeper. But I think in most of these cases you can make an attempt to remove them without rushing to exoneration right away. And we have a handful of patients who have been advised orbital exoneration by top quality oculoplastic surgeons. And we have just gone ahead and done uh, local excision with therapy. and cryotherapy and complete removal of the visible tumor. And these patients, some of them are now four or five years after the uh, advice of having exoneration, and they're still doing fine, some with 20-20 vision. Yeah. So another topic on melanoma. Uh, there's a new marker for melanoma. It's called BRAF. It's a marker that's seen in patients who have skin melanoma occasionally and conjunctival melanoma occasionally. Um, Dr. Sarah, do you advise that patients be tested for BRAF and why should they be tested for BRAF? Yeah, so I usually, depending on the size of the lesion, because um, definitely you need a tumor sample uh, to be sent to the lab for the BRAF testing, but I do generally advise uh, the BRAF testing. It's not something that changes the treatment of their eye, but more from the systemic standpoint. 25% of these patients will go on to develop metastatic disease. And so knowing um, that there's a certain mutation in their uh, tumor may help uh, with targeted therapy in the future if they yeah. develop that uh, met metastasis. Exactly. So there's new medications that are directed against BRAF. One of them is vemurafenib. And there are other uh, medications similarly that can be uh, targeted against metastatic melanoma. Some people ask the question if BRAF is something that you would expect to see in relatives and family members or those with a history of other tumors. What's the status about that? Yeah. So BRAF is found, it's a somatic mutation in the melanoma itself. It is not a germline mutation in their blood. So other family members would not carry the BRAF mutation. So does anyone have any final comments on pigmented conjunctival tumors? You know, we covered uh, conjunctival nevus, the most common one that you'll be seeing. A little bit on racial melanosis and primary acquired melanosis. And I think with Pam, it's really important to look at size because size matters. If it's bigger, you really want to resect it or freeze it or use topical therapies. And melanoma, the one we all fear, it's a surgical tumor. We have to completely excise it. I guess the last point might be on, you know, reconstruction for following surgical uh, removal of melanoma, some of the new things that's available with amniotic grafting? Yes, yeah, so we've been doing a lot of um, treatment with resection and local therapy. The question kind of becomes, once you're removing, like we said, melanoma has to be excised. What do you do? How do you replace this tissue? And so lots of times we'll like to do rotational grafts from up in the superior fornix if that's clean. Um, and it just depends on what their overall um, condition of the conjunctiva elsewhere on the eye is. If there isn't tissue, um, then uh, amniotic membrane grafts can be placed. We like to close tenons first.
to help from the scarring standpoint because if you do have to go back in, it is extremely difficult if just the amnion is placed on bare uh, sclera. And then also um, to help try and keep the fornix formed, uh, we like to put a Procara ring in, which helps to um, cover the surface, the cornea of the eye while you're healing, but also try to maintain uh, the fornix. Good. I think ophthalmologists should realize that there are also a large number of conditions that look like melanoma, but they're simulating lesions. And we have a long list of these, which are too much to discuss here. But keep in mind there are cases that resemble melanoma that prove to be benign lesions. And we have a good lecture on that that goes into that in details and show many lesions that were confused clinically with melanoma and proved to be something entirely different. Like fungus infection, hemorrhagic buckles and things yeah, like that. Hemorrhage foreign, foreign, bodies. foreign bodies, conjunctival hemorrhage, lymphangiomas, etc. can okay. suggest melanoma. Well, I think this concludes our talk on pigmented conjunctival tumors. I'd like to thank Dr. Sarah Lally, Dr. Jerry Shields of the Oncology Service at Will's Eye Hospital. I'm Carol Shields, and we're, we're reporting to you from the Will's Eye Alumni Society newsroom at Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia. Thank you.